I just received an urgent warning. All right, bulls and bears, let's go ahead and get into it. Bull to the bus, back in the building. Ride the bull, prepare for the bear, back with another dose. Bull to the bus, let's go ahead and get into it. BX4 News, we have a lot to talk about today, folks. October, October, right around the corner. Today's the 11th of September. Uh, so what do we have? Um, just under three weeks to go until October now. I'm not guaranteeing things are going to fall apart or explode uh, on October 1st. But in this video, we're going to cover all the things coming up in October. And I think it's a month to be prepared for, right? And I usually don't talk like this. For those of you that go back years with me on this channel, yeah, uh, you know what I've been saying is that we're going to kick the can down the road. There's going to be more inflation. And in fact, the inflation part of it, uh, I don't think that's likely to change unless something even bigger than I can imagine brings down the entire system. Um, and you can think of many things that could do that. But we're likely to see, more likely to, to uh, witness or live through a reverse market crash where instead of markets going down, they inject so much money, so much liquidity, uh, QE, right, quantitative easing, uh, bank rescues, uh, you name your cash injection program. And instead of a crash, you see markets take off, the cost of living take off, inflation take off. Because what they did in 2020, they could do that, multiply that times 10, multiply that times 100, right? There's no limit to the amount of money, quote unquote money, that they can throw at whatever problem comes up, right? So let's get into some news. We've got a warning from Ally Bank, and we're going to talk about the October situation here just uh, just a bit here. Uh, a warning, though, from Ally Bank, and this is uh, what we've been warning about, about the consumer's. Uh, slow the consumer slowdown, the state of the U.S. consumer uh, right here. Allies stock drops as CFO says consumers are struggling and delinquencies are rising. So now we have a bit of truth out from one of the uh, major financial institutions, in this case, Ally, huge in the automobile loan market. Uh, consumers are struggling. Well, that's just the opposite because Janet Yellen and... Um, Powell from the Fed there said consumers were strong, uh, resilient, that consumers are keeping the economy going with their spending. Of course, they don't tell you that the spending is mostly borrowed money. Uh, remember, lend, spend, and pretend that the economy is good. Shares of Ally Financial plunged Tuesday as the CFO came out and said the auto loan portfolio is struggling and more delinquencies and net charge offs were higher than expected in July and August, uh, per the CFO. Uh, he also said the bank expects net charge-offs to continue rising in the coming months. Of course, right? And that, that's not really news to people that have been on this channel. But now we have the CFO of, of Ally coming out and saying, saying the obvious, what we knew here, but it's not really being talked about too much, uh, too much in the business world. Um, Ally Financial Stock sank after the CFO said consumers are struggling, uh, that credit challenges have, quote, intensified, that's his words, <clears throat> during the current quarter, uh, struggling with high inflation and the cost of living, and now more recently, a weakening employment picture. Folks, everything's coming together. People have too much debt. Uh, there are people out there that think that even though the debt today is worse than just before the financial crisis in 08, that everything will be fine because they're going to just come to the rescue of the consumers, aka stimulus check program 2.0, like we saw in 2020, 21, 22. But the problem is inflation was much lower back then. The cost of living was much lower back then before the multiple rounds of stimulus checks were rolled out. Not just that, but all the corporate welfare, the bank uh, reserve requirement dropping to zero in 2020. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute also because um, the powers that be, the uh, the central bank in this case, just caved to the banks, right? So that's going to be one of the other big news items we want to cover here. But yeah, Ally Financial, giving a warning, no shock to anyone here. We knew the consumer is in pretty big trouble and in some pretty, um, pretty muddy waters, so to speak here. Um, next headline here, the Fed backpedaled, unveils scaled back proposal 
for bank capital requirements. Remember, um, the bank reserve requirement was set to zero in 2020 because of the quote unquote emergency slash health crisis. Um, it's been zero. <laughs> so it's like the emergency never ended. According to that particular program, there still is an emergency ongoing ever since 2020 because they kept it at zero, meaning the banks didn't have to have any capital, any funds, and they could still keep loaning out money, right? Much different than we saw in the previous hundred plus years. We've never seen this before. It's been going on for four plus years, going on five years now. Um, and they were going to make the biggest banks hold a lot of capital. And I say a lot from compared to just recent history here would have been 19% for some of these banks, uh, the biggest banks. Uh, and that's still, that's only less than one fifth of what they're loaning out. So in other words, for every hundred million they loan out, they would have had to have 19 million in deposits, right? If that were to, to remain, but they just scaled back that requirement. In fact, they scaled it back quite a bit. Uh, the Fed unveiled plans that would massively scale back a proposal to raise capital requirements for a bank after politicians, of course, uh, and banking industry pushed back on the initial plan, which would restrict lending and hurt the economy. That right there, let me bring this up here. That right there should tell you that this whole economic growth uh, scheme is based on lending. Warning, the new requirements could restrict lending and hurt economy. Are you guys reading this? Are you seeing this? Right? It's not just me making this stuff for the past. I'm not making this stuff up for the past. How, however many years I've been talking about this. I, I lost track. <clears throat> Warning, it could restrict lending and hurt the economy. In other words, the economy is dependent on lending. In other words, dependent on you taking out loans and going further into debt. So do you wonder why now? Is it clear now why the banks have to be continually able to loan out money, even though people are defaulting now, defaults are rising, even though deposits close to a 40 year low, the savings rate is plunged. The banks don't have even a fraction of what they're loaning out. It's actually less than 1% right now for most banks. In other words, they're loaning out close to 100 times what they have in deposits, which is pretty scary. Now, the capital requirement uh, here, listen to this. The new proposal would increase capital levels for big banks like Chase, like Bank of America, um, by 9% down from the original plan, which would have been, like I said a minute ago, 19%, right? So that is the pushback from the banks and the politicians instead of 19%. Now it's going to be likely 9%. And I've always raised the question here, will it even be 9%? Will they even be able to stick to, even if they re-implement that, will they be able to stick to it or will they just reverse it? Look at the student loans. The student loans almost a year ago were supposed to resume. But what they did is they made payments a fraction of the normal amount uh, on these this on what they're calling the on-ramping. And uh, I think that's even going to have to be pushed back because we're already seeing defaults with these student loans, defaults rising, and they haven't even gotten back to their normal payment amount. Do you see what's going on here? Why would that be if everybody is in a great, um, if the consumer was in a great position and resilient and everything else, uh, banks with assets between $100 billion and $250 billion would have initially been subject to stricter standards. Um, so folks, uh, what do you think about this? They basically caved in to the banking industry because they knew if the banks didn't loan out so much money and allow people to go further into debt, um, that it would implode the economy. Basically they, they came out and said it, that was their words, not mine. Uh, so what do you think about that folks? Here's how another, uh, outlet put it here. How they worded this here. The fed reserve is caving to the big banks. Again, a modest effort to enforce capital requirements, on financial institution has fallen by the wayside. We will all pay for this surrender in the next too big to fail bailout. That's how they're putting it. Remember, the more banks are propped up, AKA bailed out, the worse inflation gets. The only way to bring down inflation is to bring down the lending and to take away the easy money. And remember in the housing market, another big factor is corporate investors buying up a lot of homes, right? Because Think about it. That's just like a big down payment assistance program. So when you have a bunch of new buyers into the market, down payment assistance, corporate buyers, pick your buyer. 
it's going to push prices up and it's going to keep this bubble inflated. And we're going to get into real estate here in just a bit, but also on this topic of uh, banks giving warnings. Here's another warning. Here's what credit card companies are saying. Card holders are ditching miles, you know, the reward miles when you spend so much money and you earn miles for travel. Well, now that instead of miles, they want, uh, instead of miles and points, they want cash back. Why? Because more and more people are unable to pay off their balance each month and they see the, the it's not, I shouldn't laugh. They see the balance rising exponentially because of the accrued interest. And when you don't pay it off in full, the interest accrues. And now with these current rates of 20 plus percent on most credit cards, uh, people are taking the cash back. So no brainer there. You know, we knew that was going to be uh, one of the things happening here. A um, couple other things here before we get into the real estate news today. And uh, what do we have here? Let me just refresh it so I can read the headline here. Another warning, consumer shift spending to pay for basic staples. And uh, they keep the subscription thing popping up. That's per the CDCFO. Consumers are shifting their spending habits to pay for basic staples. So instead of a lot of entertainment stuff, like we see all these people now cutting back on cable TV and movie streaming apps, all those things, uh, more people now just saving money and using their credit cards to pay for staples like their utility bills. Uh, more people now trying to pay their rent with a credit card. And uh, we see a lot of um, landlords now accepting credit card payments and some of them are charging an extra fee for renters that have to pay with credit cards. Right now, some people want to pay with credit cards because they can just earn points and get the cash back. So if you pay rent with a credit card, that's a big expense. So maybe you'll get some points that you can get some cash back. So kind of like cash back for paying rent uh, for those landlords that do allow credit cards to be paid. But the fact that people need to use their credit card to pay the rent, you know, that should raise some alarm bells, uh, I think, to some people as well. Um, let's talk about this here. Going back to the CPI. Now, we know this is a... Uh, phony number, I mean, for the most part here. But just look, even even comparing apples to apples, we know this is way too low. The official number is way too low. But the uh, reading that we saw in August, 2.5% CPI, um, go back to pre-2020, um, you know, we were just in the 1% range for most of 2019 up until 2020. And of course, we saw the plunge with the initial shutdown of the economy. It ramped up to about 9%. So now the talking point right now out of the current administration is, hey, look, inflation's coming down. Isn't this great? We're headed in the right direction. Well, of course it's headed down from, from the worst, 9%. Um, but look at pre-2020, and we were in the mid-1% range. So still not back where we were, but everyone is supposed to believe and be convinced that that's great news. And by the way, the debate... Uh, today's the 11th. The debate was, was it just yesterday? Yeah, the debate, quote unquote debate. I didn't hear anything and I just watched um, the, the snippets from each uh, particular question. And uh, that way I can skip the commercials and stuff like that. I didn't hear anything that was going to drastically change or help the average person. I heard a lot of rhetoric, a lot of, oh, we've got a plan for this. We've got a plan for that. But no one said what the plan actually was. <laughs> I didn't hear anything about holding the banks accountable. I didn't hear anything about uh, stopping the all the down payment assistance programs um, and everything else that was keeping the housing bubble inflated. I didn't hear anything about bringing the cost of living down, going back to sound currency. Zero, zero on all those topics. Now you see why I say I, I don't even participate in this whole selection process that's coming up in November. I don't participate. Because what it is, there's a lot, of, a lot of wedge issues that are put out there that divide people and make people think, okay, I have to vote for this or that in order to solve this huge problem. Whether it's immigrants uh, eating ducks or um, reproduction rights, you know, all these different uh, wedge topics that they can they take completely opposite sides. The left, you know, has one uh, view versus the right. And they do that on purpose. Everybody split on particular topics to make you feel like, okay, you've got to choose one or the other to make you feel like you have a choice, but you really don't. When the major issues come up, financial issues, the financial system, you have no choice. It's going to be more rock bottom interest rates, more quantitative easing, more keeping the banks propped up, more 
very low capital requirements for the banks, uh, more government buying up debt to keep mortgage rates suppressed. And look at the drop in mortgage rates recently. You don't have to believe me. Just look at the mortgage rate drop. Um, more of this to keep the bubbles inflated, to keep the lending um, flowing, so to speak. Because when the lending stops, just like that article we looked at at the beginning, when the lending stops, the economy comes to a screeching halt and um, we're done, folks. Jobs, you think the job losses are bad now with nearly a million unemployed every month, uh, just wait until the lending just slows down. It doesn't even have to get cut off. The lending just has to slow down. Um, and that's why it's so important for them to keep the banks going here. Let's dive over into real estate, folks, the housing bubble. One of the key things that I've been focused on here for years, and I think I might've been the only one out there saying the housing bubble was not going to go bust unless we see a major structural change in the way money is being loaned out in the way that, uh, buyers are purchasing these homes and including up to the billionaires buying these homes, home price cuts reached highest level in five years as sellers show patience and modesty, right? So we're not seeing the desperate home sellers like we did in the previous bust, uh, but the highest level in five years for home price cuts, it does tell us that a shift is happening. And I'm not denying there is a shift. Things are changing. Um, we're seeing home price growth dramatically slow down and even dropping in some areas. We talk about them here all the time at least a few times a week, we cover real estate, but it's not the crash that so many people were warning about. Again, in order to see a crash, we have to see the banks frightened and drastically pull back on the spending like it happened in 2008. Now it's just the opposite. The capital requirements are still going to be low, even after this October 1st re-implementation of the capital requirements. And that's if they even stick to it. I think if some, once something breaks or once the next crisis pops up, they may go back to zero requirements for the banks here. But uh, still on the topic of real estate, here is someone in New York. And look what they're paying here. Let me bring this up here. Someone in New York is paying $2,100 a month in rent in a, a communal living situation, living with 23 roommates where they have to share a bathroom. So it's almost like a dorm living situation, but $2,100 a month. So Whoever owns this building where students are paying $2,000 a month and there's 23 of them, right? How much money are they bringing in, folks? This is insane. For this one building, let's just say $2,000 times 23 students, they're making $46,000 a month in rent from these, I guess they're students. It says this one's a student. Maybe the other ones are not students. But folks, this is insane that people are willing to do this and, and not just willing, but capable of doing this, right? Uh, looks like a young person. Would you have been capable of paying 2000 a month uh, and living with 23 other people? It's just uh, things like this just blow my mind, folks. Uh, more on real estate here. We've got this uh, illusion of success. And here's another reality TV person here and uh, sort of realtor. Late real estate mogul Brandon Miller died with only $8,000 and $34 million in debt. And I guess that she was an influencer and I, I guess he was on some of the reports here, some of the episodes rather. Uh, $34 million in debt, just $8,000 in savings. Weeks, weeks after Miller took his own life at age 43, documents revealed the true extent of his financial struggles. Uh, he had a $15.5 million home in the Hamptons a mansion that he shared with his wife, Candace. She rose to online fame with the success of her blog. Anyways, another guru slash multimillionaire that really was putting out an illusion of wealth and prosperity based on borrowed money, right? And he ended up, uh, you know, a very unhappy individual, even though he looked like he was the big baller, so to speak, right, for a while. Uh, pretty sad, pretty sad. Um, let's talk about what's happening in one particular town where you can buy homes for $400 here. Here's some rock bottom real estate here. Tiny Arkansas town where homes sell for $400. So you want to talk about affordable housing? There you go. There's your dream house right there. Just fix it up. The problem in this town is hardly any jobs. The schools are awful, partly because the tax base is basically nothing because the homes are so cheap there. Pine Bluff, Arkansas, just outside of Little Rock. 
This home recently sold for $402. Um, and there was uh, featured and videos about it here. Pine Buff, $400 abandoned homes. Uh, look at that. It's a video out if you guys want to watch the full video. Um, those industries changed uh, in the deep south there. There was a lot of farming. Uh, now there's bad crime. And the town is basically devastated. But if you want to talk about cheap real estate, there you go. Now, what's the catch on the $400 home? The catch that they're speaking about is the fact that the population is shrinking. In fact, it lost over 12% of its population in the last decade. And it's America's one of America's largest, fastest shrinking cities or fastest shrinking cities, meaning losing the most uh, population. So they're trying to revitalize the neighborhoods and get people to uh, purchase these homes. Now, this is what the mega investors should be buying these fixer uppers which will be very challenging for the average person to buy this especially if you're renting somewhere and then you go buy a fixer upper like this home it's very difficult for people just the average working person to continue to pay rent while fixing up a home that you just bought even if it's four hundred dollars fixing up this home you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars to make this livable and who, who knows there could be asbestos there could be mold it could be 40, 50, 60, 100,000 dollars by the time you're done. Most people that are just average renters or average working class person cannot afford to do it. So this would be the one situation where I would say, okay, maybe it would be better to have the billionaires come in and buy these particular homes. I think there should be guidelines on the types of homes that an investment company that holds 10 or more homes, for example, uh, is able to buy. To me, that would be a solution. But of course, back to the debate last night, nobody was actually talking about that at all. Because if you look at Detroit, if you look at this city here in Arkansas and thousands of other cities across America, uh, there are a lot of rundown empty homes that no one can actually buy and fix up or flip or fix up to live in uh, either way. All right, let's move on here. Let's talk about what's coming up in October, folks. October, a very important month. We have the supposed re-implementation of the bank capital requirements that was just trimmed down from 19% down to less than 10% that we just talked about at the beginning of the video. If that's introduced, that could be a major shift and we could see a major drop off in lending if that happens. Remember, most of the banks don't have the capital that they're supposed to have. So will they cut back on the lending? Uh, will they offer a bigger um, incentive for people to deposit money, like maybe a higher savings rate, right? Instead of the very low 5% and less that we've seen over the past few years. So we'll have to see how that plays out October, also the BRICS nations meeting. Uh, there's speculation that they're going to announce the going live of their new financial slash payment system. Um, will it happen? If it happens, will it be instant? Well, likely not, but still be on the lookout. Also, we have rumors around that there's going to be a big dumping of U.S. dollars as this new BRICS payment system is rolled out. And they're saying it's going to be 40% gold backed. Again, sounds too radical to be true. It sounds like such a big change that even I don't believe it. But be cautious because even the rumors of what may be happening, uh, if even a fraction of these are true, uh, it's going to be huge, right? And there's also, uh, I've got information, some feedback here recently that the BRICS nations are confirming that 100 and 159 participants slash countries will participate in their payment system. Folks, there's only like 190 countries in the entire world. So we're talking about over three-fourths of the global uh, countries that could be going to this payment system. If, if what they say is true, again, don't believe everything I say because I'm getting it from a source who might be getting it from another source. I try to show you my sources. I bring them up on the screen. A lot of channels don't even do that. Um, at least I show you my sources, but I also give you my uh, input, You know, not just reading the headlines here. Um, another one here, experts issue warning, credit card users, warning to credit card users as debt hits 100, uh, 1.14 trillion. And it just went up here in the last quarter. Again, we're talking about somebody here with 1200, uh, no, they're talking about somebody with 12,000 credit card debt. I'll let you guys read on that if you want to, but the, uh, increase was 5.8%. From a year ago with this credit card debt 5.8 percent so the credit card debt percentage wise is going faster 
are going up more than the inflation number that we're given, right? So that should tell you something right there, folks. Buckle up, strap in October. Not saying it's going to happen, folks, but be ready for it. As always, keep stacking. Hard assets, my favorite, still silver. Let me know what you think about this down in the comments. Talk to you very soon. Bye for now. Peace.